in calling this magic and kitsch, I'm really struggling to find the right word. When I talked about magic and lies, which again wasn't quite the right word, I was referring to the fact that um, the scientific establishment puts great value on truthfulness. And that makes a problem with the, with the magical way of working, which not only incorporates truthfulness, but also plays with illusion and deceit and certain forms of trickery in a way that is not really acceptable to the scientific establishment. And so I called it magic and lies. Now, in the case of the artistic establishment, magic incorporates things which um, are not acceptable, again, for the artistic establishment. It isn't such a big problem, but I think it's based on the fact that um, magic or art inherits from magic a sense of meaning, which is a bit of a problem. You see, when you make a magical object, um, painting a tarot card, constructing a fetish or an amulet for some particular purpose, you deliberately put in as many symbols as you can that would have the right effect. But when you do that in a work of art, and it is done in art, just think of all those Madonnas holding lilies and things like that, um, you mustn't do it in too obvious a way. It mustn't be too deliberate. To illustrate that, have you seen a picture called, I think it's the Orchid on the Steps, which shows in photorealistic detail a, step, a set of grey, cold-looking stone steps in a big city and dropped in the middle is a fresh orchid flower. I find that a very moving picture, perhaps because I was a country boy who was plucked by a scholarship out to a city school at a young age. But whatever the reason, um, I think it's rather beautiful. But I suspect that the art establishment would see it as a piece of kitsch. And the clue to that is the fact that it wasn't painted by a penniless poor artist, but by a very wealthy man um, who uh, produces pictures like this for film stars, sports stars, business tycoons, politicians, the sort of people that would be considered to have rather more money than sense or artistic sense. Now, you see, seen in that light, you can sort of analyse this picture and say, right, rich people like value for money. So this isn't a slop and trickle painting. This is um, a piece of photo realistic. It's real craftsmanship. It is beautifully crafted, this picture. Rich people like orchids. There's your subject. Rich people can feel sometimes that they're isolated by their wealth from other people. Loneliness, now that's a useful theme. The orchid on a petal has a drop of water. Now that not only suggests freshness, it's only just fallen there, but also isn't there a hint of a tear in that? And so on. The whole thing begins to look like a very deliberate um, attempt to produce a picture that is going to sell for a lot of money. And as a piece of art, that is kitsch, it is rather unacceptable. But of course, as a piece of magic, that is perfectly fine. This really, this person is creating an amulet with all the symbols in it to attract a wealthy buyer. Now, that um, in art, there are actually, there are some very fine representations of magic. It's not all negative. Uh, there are, I mean, Harry Potter presents, those novels present a very nice picture of magic and what it's about. Um, and there are all those movies that show Merlin, the great magician, or Gandalf, you know, looking magnificent and doing wonderful things. But I think that the art establishment, the critics, would tend to see that sort of work as being a little bit lowbrow, you know, at the bottom end of the art spectrum. Whereas when you move to sort of midbrow and higher, you tend to see magic portrayed in a very negative light. I can think of A.S. Byatt's novel, A Whistling Woman. And in there, the astrologer woman is, of course, depicted as fat, 
um, and uh, she wears ridiculous blousy uh, tent-like dresses um, and is covered with dripping with jewellery and uh, amulets and pentagrams and anks and all that sort of stuff. And she speaks in such a way that her academic colleagues see her as absurd, a ridiculous figure. In the movie The Master, where the character which is based on Ron Hubbard, founder of Scientology, is presented as a rather sort of dubious, um, uh, slightly undercover figure. And I remember when Foucault's Pendulum, Umberto Eco's novel came out, the first reaction of, of the critics was to be astonished that someone of his intelligence should actually write about occultists. And then they decided, oh, actually, he's being very clever because he's showing up how ridiculous these people are in this novel. Now, the problem here is um, not just what has been written about and what has been said about magic, but what is still happening. And um, my experience actually goes back to the 1980s, but the sort of thing that used to happen then was that um, I would get a phone call out of the blue from a, a television researcher. And he says, they think you're doing a program about magic. And my heart would sink. And then he would say, oh, but we want to be different. We want to do a serious program of magic. And I'd have a sort of flicker of hope, you know. And then he'd say, and that's why we were told to speak to you. And then I'd feel quite good about it. Um, now, what actually happened was we tend to have a very good conversation, you know, where the person genuinely is interested and asks good questions. And it all begins to look quite promising. But the problem is that researcher has to go back to as it were, the artistic, the creatives, the director and the um, cameraman, and the people who are actually going to make this programme. And that often means you don't hear any more. But if you do, what happens is, a long time later, you get a phone call. Uh, we've decided we won't interview you for this programme, because we've got a, um, a panel already, um, but we would like your help. Do you think you could stage a ritual for us that we could just shoot a, a few minutes of it um, as material for this programme? And I would always say no, because you know exactly what this programme is going to be. It's going to consist of a round table of Renterboffin academics, including, of course, the historian or psychologist who will rattle off the usual thing about, in times of change and uncertainty, people... The, the masses tend to fall back on a need for primitive ways of thinking and the reassurance of the occult. And then you'll have a bishop who says, of course we should be very pleased that these young people are looking for spiritual experience, but it's just a pity that they haven't been educated to proper spirituality and so on. And then, to create a balance to all this sensibleness, you have to have a bit of madness. And that is where we will see um, naked witches dancing um, around the bonfire or fat middle-aged occultists in a sitting room with candles and so on and so forth. Now, there is in that experience of you know, dancing naked magicians, um, there is obviously visual uh, kitschness. But inwardly, there is beauty in that. And it's quite hard for us to realise that um, in our very visual age. But the way to experience that really is to yourself on your own when no one's looking, and preferably in near darkness or just a, a candle. Put on a favourite rhythmic record, take off your clothes and dance to it. And it, once you get over that sort of hump of, oh my God, I look ridiculous, and you forget that, it could be a very beautiful experience. And to be able to share that experience in a group when you're not worried about what you're looking like the other people is great. But it is also at the same time, visually, not very attractive. And the irony is, you see, if you did happen to do it very beautifully, if you've got beautifully choreographed movements and, and they're all looking absolutely wonderful, quite likely the television team would say, um, yeah, but that's ballet. Can't we have something a bit more authentic?
that is the problem that I, what I'm calling magic and kitsch. The fact that to the artistic establishment, there is a lot in magic that is considered to be um, very dubious, ugly, laughable. And that is always how you will be represented by so-called serious media.